Welcome back to this month's episode of The Skin Check. The Skin Check with Jen is a monthly segment hosted by me, Jen Schultz, as an opportunity for LUV ambassadors and other skin cancer advocates, a platform to share their story, offer advice, and show support for others. So today I'm really excited to introduce everyone to Amanda Weaver. Amanda's a wife and mom. She lives in West Central Florida. She loves outdoor adventures, especially hiking and camping. And as one of the newest Low Ultraviolet ambassadors, Amanda loves encouraging people to get outside, but also educating them on how to do so while still staying sun safe. So Amanda, I want to thank you so much for being here on our episode today. And then just to get us started, I'd like to have you tell us a little bit more about who you are as a person outside of melanoma and skin cancer before we dive into your story. Definitely. Well, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here with you. Um, so my name is Amanda. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in Florida, just right off the coast of uh, the West Coast, right under our south of Tampa. Um, I am an accounting coordinator Monday through Friday. And then when I'm not at work, I'm a mom. Um, like you said, I do enjoy being outside. Um, nature is like my therapy. Um, so I love to hike board. I used to love to go to the beach, but now I only do that when the sun's setting, which is totally fine. Um, but yeah, I have two little girls. They're my world. Um, my husband, he's also just a fantastic supporter. Uh, and yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah. And then honestly, the sunset or like sunrise on the beach is probably one of the be most beautiful times to be there. Yes. yes. And Hands so, down. Yes, 100%. Um, and then we have talked a little bit before too about how like a lot of times people associate like Florida with tanning and things like that, but there's so many other opportunities to be sun safe while still enjoying and taking in everything um, that Florida has to offer. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like I was talking about before, um, you know, Florida, especially being just five minutes from the beach, um, that's, I grew up, <clears throat> you know, going to the beach all the time. It's something that was free. I live five minutes from the beach. Um, I, growing up, my parents, they put sunscreen on me, but like never reapplied. So every time I went to the beach, I would always get sunburned. Um, and then that progressed up into becoming a teenager and then wanting to be tan at that point and using baby oil or like sun, um, exemplifiers to like get tan really fast, which would just cause me to be burned. Um, I've probably had over 300 sunburns um, in my life, which is really crazy um, thinking back on it now. But yeah, that's just being outside. I was so naive. I never really thought to protect my skin. Um, obviously, now I'm taking proactive measures to better protect my skin and my children as well. Um, but, you know, the damage to my skin is already done. Um, even though now I am doing what I can to, you know, in the future, hopefully not have more damage to my skin, but that damage is already done. So. Yeah. And that's one of the misconceptions that we've also talked about with um, skin cancer and just sun in general is a lot of people think once the tan or once the tan fades, once the burn fades and becomes tan, that they're okay. And a lot of times people reference it as a healthy tan, but our skin remembers all of that. And so it's great that we can make changes now, but it's hard not to go back and think about like our skin is remembering all of those things that we did in the past. And that's why it's so important to not only like you're doing with your kids, teaching them about sun protection at the beginning, but then really instilling those habits at young ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. They definitely know, you know, before going outside every day, you wear sunscreen at least that's at least that's like bare minimum. Mm -hmm. You wear sunscreen. They know to wait 15 minutes. Um, you know, they're not always like, okay with it you know sometimes i get a little bit of sassiness um but they do understand that you know mommy has had bad skin um they don't know the severity of it because they're still young they're only six and eight um but they do know that i've had bad skin they know it's because of the sun um and so they know that it's really important for them to take care of their skin as well and we were talking a little bit earlier about how just even at the beginning of 2023, you had posted on social media a picture where you actually had a sunburn. And now looking back at it, 
um, a lot has really happened for you since that picture. Can you tell us a little bit more about your personal journey with both skin cancer and melanoma since then? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So when I had originally posted that picture on my Instagram stories, I don't looking at it now, it's so cringy, but I was like, oh, first sun sunburn of 2023 or something along those lines. And like I was proud of being sunburned. And now looking back, I'm, you know, all of the sunburns that I've had leading up until my diagnosis, I just I wish I could rewind. Obviously I can't, um, but it actually started back in December. This was before I had noticed the mole on my arm start to change pretty drastically. Um, I'm a very moly person, so I don't know. You know, they say that it's more rare to have a melanoma start in a mole that you've had for a while, but because I have so many, I don't know, you know, if it was new, but I had noticed that it started changing. Um, it was in January that I noticed it started changing, but actually back in December, I was just scrolling on tick or on Instagram and something was like search skin cancer, like as a hashtag. And I like, I wasn't even I didn't see anything in regards to skin cancer, like while I was scrolling. So I just, you know, I went ahead and I looked at it. And then of course, like basal cell and squamous cell showed up. I didn't see any melanomas show up. Um, and then that was that I kind of just like went along my merry way. And then in January, the end of January is when I noticed that the mole on my arm had drastically started changing. Mm -hmm. It was growing bigger. Um, it didn't look like melanoma. Um, looking back, it's still like, it doesn't look like your typical melanoma, but I also think it's important not to compare what melanoma looks like on Google images, um, and think that you don't have it because to the naked eye, you, it could look like a completely normal mole, but under the scope, um, or even a biopsy, of course it could be something. Um, anyways, so moving on. <laughs> so, uh, in, uh, April, I had made a dermatologist appointment because I had noticed the mole just every day. It felt like it was growing, it was changing. And so months pass and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to get this checked out. Um, my insurance kicked in because I actually had lost my job due to um, my boss's committing fraud last year. So I was actually jobless at the end of last year. And so when I had got the job that I have now, I had to wait until my insurance kicked in to, and that was the first thing that I did was make a dermatologist appointment. So um, in April, I did that. And even the dermatologist, the PA was like, well, it, you know, moles can change if your body's fighting something off. And I was kind of like, well, that's a little weird. And even at that appointment, skin cancer never crossed my mind. I was like, I left that appointment with three biopsies and I was like, I'm doing self-care. Like I felt so good. Like it just, it never crossed my mind. And even my primary care physician, I showed him, he was like, it looks okay. I showed my family. They were like, well, it's not raised, which that's another thing. Your mole doesn't need to necessarily be a raised mole. Moles can be flat on the skin as well. Um, and so, but yeah, sure enough, I get the call that I had melanoma and I was at work <clears throat> and the service was really bad. So I couldn't really like hear what she was saying. She was just like, mm -hmm. we caught it early. And even on the phone with the nurse, I was like, well, my husband's birthday is the next day because they were trying to schedule surgery. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, my husband's birthday is the next day. I'm like, this is all, this is too much. Can I just call you? <laughs> like, I'm like, I'll yeah. call, can I call Can I talk to my husband first? Like, and the, the nurse was like, uh, I mean, I'll save the appointment, but it's really important that you get in. And I'm like, okay, you know, whatever. And then, so I go back to my desk and I look up melanoma. And the first thing that pops up, of course, is like the Google definition of melanoma with like a little picture. And it's like deadliest form of skin cancer. My stomach dropped. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like mm -hmm. this, what? I had no idea. And so of course, um, I, as soon as I got off work, I called the office right back and I was like, of course, like I'll make the appointment. I'll do what I have to do. Um, and then that just kind of like changed the whole, my whole life. Honestly, I went from naively going out tanning, even just being outside in general. I love to run outside. Um, I like to walk outside. Nature's just always been something that I've gone to when I'm, you know, when my mental illness feels like it's taking over. <clears throat> and so 
you know, I felt like that was stripped from me. I'm like, wow, I can't even enjoy going outside because I'm so scared that I'm going to have another melanoma and all of my moles look abnormal. And that was another thing. It's like, I don't know what's normal or like benign versus it being cancer. So I was just, I was so scared. There was days where like, I couldn't like brush my teeth. I couldn't take a shower. I had slipped in such a depression just because I already have like mental illness. And then I also was having just that internal battle with myself because I was like, I have such an early stage of melanoma and there's people that are fighting their lives right now. And so I was also mm -hmm. like feeling guilty for feeling bad. And um, so I had like that going on and it just happened all so fast that I didn't really have time to process what was going on either. And then, you know, I let myself feel my feelings. And then I was like, I, I started slowly going back outside after I started researching um, sun safety, how, you know, wearing UPF clothing, obviously trying to seek shade as much as possible. Don't go outside, you know, in the sun from like 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, I actually have an app on my phone, like on my home screen that tells me the UV rays for mm -hmm. the specific times to make sure that I'm, you know, trying not to go outside during those times. Um, but yeah, so since then, I, it really put life into perspective and I, we all have bucket lists on things that we want to do. And I was like, I'm just gonna live life now you know i started doing things that i normally would just tell myself one day um i've stepped on my comfort zone uh tremendously even doing something like this is typically not something that i would do i'm more of like an introvert um but it it truly did change my life it brought me friendships that you know i could have never imagined having um i it's Melanoma is such a blessing and a curse. It's mm -hmm. it's heavy, but it also like it brought me so many good people as well. Yeah, you bring up so many important points in there that there's a few of them I want to go back to. And one of the first ones you said was how like when you showed it to your family and they're like, it's not raised or when you showed it to your doctor and he wasn't overly concerned, like the first piece just even in there is like, we know our own bodies best and it's so important to listen to our gut. But then also when it comes to skin cancer and not just because there's different types, but even with melanoma alone, what a normal mole for me looks like might be completely like an atypical mole for you and vice versa. And so like, it's great that there are images that we can use for education and things like that, but we really have to look at what doesn't look right for us and what doesn't match the rest of our moles. Um, but then even amongst ourselves, like you and I have talked a lot about like all of our moles look scary and bad <laughs> and there just isn't like a one size fits all. This is what melanoma looks like, or this is what skin cancer looks like. Yeah, I even get um, messages from people, they'll message me pictures of their moles. And they're like, hey, does this look weird? You know, and I always tell them when in doubt, just get it checked out. Mm -hmm. If you have an inkling, like something doesn't look right to you, like you know your body best, please get it checked out. Like that's, I mean, if anything, you get a biopsy and it comes back normal and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Or worst case scenario, you know, you it gets caught late or you just, you never know. It's just, it's better to go to a board certified dermatologist. Don't go to your primary, don't go to a walk-in, go to somebody that's specifically trained to see, you know, what those characteristics. And you and I only know what looks normal or not for us. So like we can give <laughs> our quote unquote advice, but right. we are not dermatologists. Exactly. And so you, we especially with something as um, potentially dangerous, but as serious as melanoma, always make sure that you're getting an actual medical opinion. Yeah. And then another thing that you really touched on too is like how at the end of the year you lost insurance and there's so many barriers just to care in general, even if we have insurance. And so like <laughs> that's such an important piece. And I think a lot of times with skin checks, people don't, put those up there as one of like the most important things that we knew, like need to do where you and I now know 
annual skin checks minimum are what should everyone should be doing. But until you go through something like that, if you're looking through where can I cut costs, save money, especially if I don't have great insurance, have expensive copays, or I don't have insurance at all, I think a lot of times skin checks are probably going to be like one of the first ones cut. They seem less necessary, but they are mm-hmm. so important. Yeah, I agree completely. And I was actually going to touch on that too, that, you know, we're, we're in a time where things are becoming more expensive. Insurance is skyrocketing. Um, you know, I have a high deductible as well. And last year when I had lost my job, <clears throat> I was also like, I was like, why is this happening? You know, like I, I, at the time I really enjoyed my job. Um, I made great money, but looking at it now in hindsight, it's always 2020, you know, and, and looking back, I'm like, I lost that job because if I wouldn't have lost that job, I wouldn't have, I probably still would have melanoma because I mm-hmm. would have never really, cause I didn't have health insurance. Um, and so if I just, you know, it is, it's a great point. If, even if you don't have health insurance, like please try to save money to just go get a skin check. Um, because melanoma can develop anywhere, um, in places that you can't see. And there's a lot of places too. So I know like a lot of times, like the Melanoma Research Foundation is doing like miles for melanoma across the country in like major cities. Um, the sun bus is also like traveling around. So there's a lot of places where they can't do like a full clinic skin check, but it's an amazing place to start. And they can do that. You're getting somebody who is certified doing an initial skin check. They can't biopsy or anything like that, but they can note specific places of concern and let you know if you do have those things that you could should have like a dermatologist or somebody take a look at. So if you don't have insurance or really high deductible, like those are great places, at least like a low barrier to get started Mm -hmm. on something like that. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually, my job has a like wellness expo that they do every year and they actually partner with a dermatologist. So a dermatologist actually comes into our office and will do like those skin checks. Obviously, they're not doing biopsies in the middle of like a cafeteria, but Mm -hmm. they'll, you know, they'll give you like a skin check and let you know, like, hey, these are more high risk or you should probably biopsy this. Um, which I had no idea about. But when I found that out, I was like, wow, that is amazing. I wish employer, all employers would do something like that Mm -hmm. for their employees. Yeah, same. I have never heard of another employer doing that. And then like, that's especially big for someone like you, which you also mentioned, like you have a lot of moles. So you're like, all of my moles look atypical. Mm -hmm. And so um, just really recently, you were diagnosed with something that's called dysplastic nevus syndrome. You were aware of it, and so you weren't really surprised when you got that diagnosis. But I feel like not that many people even know what it is, um, let alone know much about it. I know you and I both have it. Um, there's one other low ultraviolet ambassador that I believe has it, and then I know one other person. So even including you and me, I know four, which is like less than the amount of fingers I have on my hand. So would you mind just explaining a little bit more about what dysplastic nevus syndrome is and then really how that impacts your relationship and experience with having melanoma? Yeah. So actually I, so I just got diagnosed with it a couple of days ago and I was starting to research it. And honestly, I couldn't really find much on it. Um, you know, just, you really have to dig for like information on what it's about. Um, my dermatologist did tell me that the risk of of developing future melanomas in somebody that has this type of, um, dysplastic nevus syndrome is much higher just because we like produce abnormal moles. That's like our baseline. Um, Mm -hmm. so I do know that I do know it's definitely more rare. I know it, I want to say it's like 8% or 12%. It's a very low number of people that have it, um, which understandably so when I went to go search like for more information on it, I really couldn't find much other than the fact that we just produce, it's a genetic thing that we just produce abnormal moles. Um, Mm -hmm. And when you have more abnormal moles, more atypical moles, the higher risk you are of developing melanoma. 
And I know with that, because you had the syndrome with your original or initial dermatologist and you hadn't been diagnosed yet, um, but I think it was sort of those visits that had you already sort of looking into what it was. Um, But ultimately, it was changing dermatologists that led you to finding out that you have this. Um, Can you share a little bit more about what it was that led you to actually making that change and finding a new dermatologist and care team? Yeah, definitely. So for me, I, I mean, a lot of people have trust issues. (laughs) I have trust Mm -hmm. issues. And for me, I, you know, it was just little things that in my gut, I'm like, well, something isn't, I just don't feel like I, my dermatologist was kind of being thorough enough. Um, you know, she did mention like, she's like, well, I think this is more genetic. Um, even though I told her, like, I've had a lot of sunburns, uh, throughout my life, I used a tanning bed only about a handful of times, but we know that you only need to use a tanning bed once really to, um, have a higher risk of developing melanoma. Um, but yeah, she never really went to detail about it. Just like, oh, well, all of your moles are normal. So we're just kind of picking the ones that look more severe. Um, and that just kind of was like, well, I'm going to go to somebody else, um, and just kind of like get a second opinion just to see, because this is my first experience with a dermatologist. I just started going this year when I initially got diagnosed with melanoma. Um, so just to see kind of like what's out there. And, um, sure enough, she was like, yeah, all of your moles under the dermatoscope, they have characteristics of being more atypical. Um, And that's what she said. She's like, you can go get um, mole mapping done, um, like with the camera where they scan all of your moles just so that we can kind of be look more into which moles might be changing um, and things like that. But yeah, it was just little things that I was just like, Uh, I just, I don't want to be pushed under the rug. Um, Yes, I had very early stage melanoma, but at the same time, like all of my moles look abnormal. And if Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm the one picking the ones out that are coming back um, atypical, uh, then I feel like maybe I should go with somebody that's going to look closer at me and take their time. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we feel that our dermatologists or any of our, you know, doctors are taking the time to see us as a person and a patient, not just a number, but I also think it really goes back and highlights the importance of what we talked about sort of at the beginning of your story. Like we know our own bodies best, but we also know in our gut what's right for us and what's not. And then Mm -hmm. it's important from that point then to like really step up and advocate for ourselves and making sure that we're getting what is right for us. With that being said, like, if what would you give um, for advice to someone that's newly diagnosed with melanoma? I would definitely say feel your feelings, <laughs> most certainly. Like, yeah. allow yourself to feel just just let yourself feel it all. And then also find a support system. If you don't have a support system, um, like I thank God every day for my husband. He has really been a rock for me. But at the same time, he has never had to, melanoma. He doesn't Mm -hmm. have anybody in his family that has had melanoma. So he couldn't really support me in the way that I just, I needed somebody to relate to me. And I think that we all can find healing and just being in relationships with people that know. And so if you don't have that support system, if you feel like you're not being understood by your support system, definitely reach out to the melanoma community. Um, Katie was one of the first people that I reached out to because I searched melanoma and she had popped up and Mm -hmm. she has been a godsend, honestly. Like, I mean, she really just like has done so much and has really like soothed my worries and you as well. And so it's just, it's important to surround yourself with people that can really just relate to you. Um, So that's what I would say. And definitely don't search on Google. (laughs) Definitely do not search on Google. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Google, uh, Google tends to come back with like the worst case results really fast. Yes. Yes. And that's another thing too, is don't go on Google and think that your mole doesn't look like the Google images and that you're okay. Um, Because I also did that and Google images will just show you worst case scenarios and ones that have already progressed. 
Um, and so like you were saying, just know your body. I didn't know my skin. I had no idea that my moles looked abnormal until I got melanoma. And I'm like, wow, yeah, my moles don't look right. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. And then going back also to Katie too, like she really is incredible. Like mm -hmm. she was one of the first people in the melanoma, that community that I connected, connected with also. And um, we're lucky to have her in the melanoma community, but then also as another Lowell to Violet ambassador too. Like she's yes. doing amazing things and bringing awareness and education and all of that, not just around melanoma, but sun safety products and ways to stay safe with things like you mentioned, like um, advocating for yourself and the UV index and all that stuff. So she's yes. an incredible source of information, but then just mm -hmm. an incredible, genuine human that's so supportive. Yes, I agree. So... And then also, like you mentioned that this is really outside of your comfort zone, um, but I do really appreciate you being here, um, especially knowing like this is a little bit extra, like difficult time. You're waiting for some biopsy results to come back, even if you don't have mental health challenges um, with like a history of depression and anxiety, it's going to stir those things up no matter what. Um even after we're, you know, no evidence of disease or NED. So like, I really appreciate you being willing to share so openly while that's kind of going on in the background. Um, but I also agree that being able to build that connection with people that truly understand helps us feel less alone. Um, you touched on it a little bit, but how important has the community been just helping you go through all of this throughout like the last really been like about 10 to 11 months? Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, it's no one compares where they are to like, like for me, because I was only in site two. So I was like stage zero very early. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter what stage people are. They just love on you and support you. And they're always there to answer any questions that you have. Um, that was it for me. It was like, I didn't know. And I didn't want to go to Google because I was going to Google and Google was just mm -hmm. like soul sucking me. And I was like, I can't, I feel like this is not good. You know, for me, I'm like a researcher. I got to like, I got to know everything. And so, but just hearing other people's stories and seeing how, you know, strong they are, even though like at the same time, like you don't have another choice. You kind of have to be strong when you're going through something, but mm -hmm. just, it's just inspiring. And like I said, being able to relate to them on a different level um, also helps versus like having a friendship or a relationship with somebody that hasn't been through it before, you know, they can say like, Oh, I understand, or I'm sorry, you know, but they don't understand the true gravity of it. And one of the things that you mentioned too, right away also reminds me of Katie because Katie was the one that gave me this advice. It's really true in the melanoma community that there isn't the comparison about where you're at or what stage you are at or were diagnosed or, how many instances of melanoma you've had or anything like that. Um, but it can still personally be hard to sometimes get into our own heads. Like why well, I was only this stage. So how do I compare mm -hmm. to somebody who's been through all of this? And one thing that Katie told me um, was that seeing people who will catch it early actually gives her hope and inspires her because people that have gone through those tougher situations, like stage four, they want people to not have to go through that and seeing us catch them early gives them hope that the education and awareness and stuff is working. And then by us that. being able to do that is able to help continue that and just grow that. And hopefully we have less melanoma as a whole, but then the ones that are happening are being caught early and earlier and we're setting like a new normal until we can finally mm. get rid of melanoma. I agree. I do love that. And I mean, to your point, like, I don't, I'm not one to look for the positive in cancer, like, you know, other situations, I would always try to find like the silver lining. But if there's one like, good 
thing that comes from this. Mm -hmm. It is the amount of messages I get saying, thank you. You know, I got a skin check. I would have never thought to got a, to get a skin check before, or I'm taking sun safety more seriously because, you know, you're raising awareness about this. I didn't know about melanoma, things like that. Um, to me, it, it's like, I hate to say like, it was something that happened, um, you know, to me for a reason, because I don't feel after this, like, I'm like, before I was like, everything happens for a reason. And now I'm like, mm -hmm. no, I, I don't think that way anymore. Um, but, you know, just getting those messages, it does mean a lot. Yeah. And the everything happens for a reason. I was kind of the same way before. And I think it is one of the many ways that going through melanoma or cancer in general changes you. There is no reason that we should have to go through cancer. And then going back again to, you know, not comparing what stage you're at, no matter what stage you are at, there is nothing bottom line that will ever prepare you to hear the words you have cancer. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so last question that I have for you is what is the biggest change that you would like to see in regards to melanoma and skin cancer? I would say taking sun safety seriously. I mean, living in Florida, I, I'll i scroll on Facebook or scroll on Instagram and I still, and you know, to each their own, everyone lives their own life, but I still see so many people just like intentionally tanning and not taking it seriously. Um, and that's the one thing that I hope with what I post, you know, people can take something away is, is taking sun safety seriously. Like wear UPF clothing, wear a wide brimmed hat, wear sunglasses, go get a skin check, uh, wear sunscreen. Like there's so many things that you can do to help prevent, if anything, prevent skin cancer and anti-aging. Like, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if anything, if you take care of your skin for any reason, like just, you know, cause we're all like, oh, anti-aging, we're in that like culture now that's like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to look my age. Um, but yeah, it definitely would be just taking sun safety seriously, especially in a state that you can go outside and go to the beach 99% of the year. Yeah, definitely. Th Amanda, thank you so much for coming on and just like really openly and vulnerably sharing um, both your story and your experience, um, especially being so new to both the melanoma community, but then also still really kind of in the thick of waiting for biopsies and stuff too. I know it's not easy and I really appreciate it. And your story will definitely make a difference for other people that are going through it. Um, for people that are listening and want to um, learn a little bit more and maybe connect with you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Amanda J. Weaver. That's W-E-A-V-E-R. Perfect. Again, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and um, can't wait for others to hear more about your story. Thank you. I appreciate it so much.